So, hi, this is Matt State from Martial Arts GB Group, and today I've got Steve Rowe with me. Now, Steve's been around for a very long time and is a pretty much one of the living legends, and so it's great to have him on board with us today. So, how are you, Steve? No, I'm fine, thanks, Matt. So, fantastic for you to come on board, mate, and have a chat with us. Now, uh, for those that don't know, could you give us a little bit, uh, a bit of a history about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. I've been training for between 45 and 50 years now, I think, um, mainly in karate. Uh, a lot of my karate study was with Toru Takamizawa. So I studied Wadaru and um, I studied Iaido with Okimitsu Fuji. And um, when he went back to Japan, Iaido and Jodo with Vic Cook. My Tai Chi studies were originally with a guy called Simon Wired back in the 1970s. And I re-picked it up with Jim Uglo and um, I did about 10 years private lessons with Jim. And Jim was kind enough to take me to Hong Kong, I think around about seven times to train with Mary Yang. Um, so, yeah, you can say really karate, iaido, jodo and tai chi are my main martial arts. I spent a long time in each of those, but in between I studied a load of others. Right, yeah. So it's... Again, it's one of those, as I said, I mean, I've, I've known who you are for a very long time, but never really had the privilege to sit and talk to you for any length. So this is great to, to have that, because um, I remember years ago seeing you on the cover of magazines and all that and that kind of thing. And so um, and so when it comes to having that sort of history um, that, that leads you to the start of that, which is really what 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 brought you into martial arts in the first place? I suppose, really, it was the. Um philosophical side in the 1960s my brother started and he started training with Tatsu Suzuki and to be honest I think the thing that appealed to me more than anything was one in those days we never met any oriental people mm -hmm. um, so just seeing oriental people was very exotic and um, when I looked at the Japanese writing I think because it was kind of pictorial writing that really appealed to me and um, I suppose it appealed to the right side of my brain and then I think I trained in karate up to around about second dan and um, then kung fu came on the telly I think in 1973 and I looked at David Carradine I mean if you bear in mind by that time I was working in the security trade um, the kind of karate I was doing, all I ever wanted to do was fight. Um, I was living probably, I come from South London, council estate boy, probably quite a violent background. And um, I knew that I was going to end up in prison or in the wrong place. Uh, so when Kung Fu came on the telly, I kind of looked at that. And I think I thought to myself, this is what I need. And so then that was when I took up Tai Chi. And um, my first Tai Chi instructor was, as you would imagine in those days, he had all his worldly belongings on his back, um, Jesus sandals, he just slept on friends' couches, he was a real kind of hippie guy. I'd been brought up as a kind of South London mod, if you like. Um, and so we were very, very different, but he was very good to me. Uh, he would let me come early and do a lot of push hands and stuff with me. And he gave me my first copy of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, which is the kind of Bible of Taoism. Mm. And I'd never read a book in my life up until then. Um, it was the first book I ever read, but it actually meant a lot to me. And that led me on to study Taoism, Zen, Buddhism, eventually on to anything that would affect the mind from ritual magic to Wicca to whatever. Uh, so it was kind of, I suppose, mind and emotional control because I was a very angry young man. Um, so that really helped me. Yeah, that, I mean, the similarities there for a lot of people are uh, exactly that is as a youth, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of anger, a lot of emotion. Uh, to be honest as well, an element of actually enjoying getting into scrapes. That's something that people don't often actually admit to. But um, I think that's a reality for a lot of young men is they want to test it, don't they? They do want to try it out and they want to sort of push the boundaries and see what they're capable of. So um, 
it's quite interesting because when you said uh, about that and that life and where you were there that you chose tai chi because you wouldn't that doesn't that wouldn't automatically seem to be the right fit yeah it, it was david carradine right it was yeah. at, at three o'clock every sunday i'd sit down to watch um kung fu uh, and those little clips in the shaolin temple um the, the little kind of statements of wisdom they just hit home to me and the only thing that i could find at that time and of course it was the softest thing i'd been doing the hardest you know so i was only fighting i wasn't even doing kata or or anything like that i was i was working in the security world i violence was an everyday thing for me and, and to be honest i think looking back in hindsight all of my life as a child, I, I, I didn't like life, I didn't enjoy it, so I didn't, didn't really do much for school, I didn't take any exams, um, I, I didn't like school, I didn't like home, I didn't like my family, I, I didn't like anything, I was just a very, very angry person. Mm -hmm. And the moment that I, I came across Tai Chi, Tai Chi was so slow, and when I started doing Tai Chi, it was agony for me to actually move slowly and, and so on. It was absolute agony, but I knew uh, that's what I needed, really. Right, yeah, that's, I mean, the, again, the, the, that resonates so strongly with uh, my own experiences growing up, not, not regards to the style, because I went into uh, karate and uh, Wado as well, oddly enough, uh, and, and got into some other stuff as well. But, but the, the reasons why, and I think, as I say, I think a lot of people sort of come into it for those reasons. So what do you think in your... Uh, I think it's, it's 50 years you've been training now? I ran about that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an extraordinary amount of time and the, the amount of knowledge that you must have sort of gathered through all that time. Um, so what, what, what do you think has changed between the training of 50 years ago to the training of today? It's very, very different. And um, when I look back 50 years ago, we did really stupid stuff. And... Uh, it was actually, it was all young guys training. All my first clubs were all young men. And basically, we just used to beat the crap out of each other. And whoever could do the most stupidest thing, break the most stupidest thing, lay on broken glass and have paving slabs smashed on them. I was at the front, you know. It was, I think there was a kind of a madness. And the other thing I think is that it, it, it was a cult, you know, so that, um, I mean, and it really was a cult. If you know, we were a very small group, and not everybody did martial arts in those days, and particularly kids didn't. And uh, it was if you didn't go training, they'd come around your house and see what was wrong with you, you know. So it was very much like a cult. We were probably very mad at that time. Um, so I don't wish those days back at all. I mean, there were some good things about I learned a lot about violence. In, in those days, um, and but I also damaged my body a lot as well. I couldn't count the amount of injuries. I, I, my nose was broken five times, I, all my teeth were smashed. I, I broke just about every finger and bone in my body at one time or another. So they were very stupid times, they were very dangerous times. Um, there were things, good things that we learned from it. One of the things for me was the fact that no one can hurt me as much as I've been hurt. And uh, no one can make me more scared than I've been scared. So I kind of reached my limits. Um, uh, well, actually, I didn't reach my limits at those times because, to be honest, it was in the last 15 years I've had 18 surgeries and some really awful ones um, that would really scare the living daylights out of me. But I learned a lot about fear at the time. And I think na nowadays martial arts is gym culture. So, you know, the only thing that we're competing with really these days is, is the gyms. And most people treat a martial arts club as if it was a gym. So it's very, very different now. Yeah, if, it, I was going to say, if we can get the balance right, it's much better. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I, I agree wholeheartedly, in fact. I mean, I, I, it's one of those where over the years, um, I started in the sort of late 80s, so after you, um, but over the years, you could see you could see it swinging, and you could see the sort of different mindsets coming in, uh, and, and 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 of course, it's a you know, we're in a position where we, if you like, there the students are our customers, and we have to serve them. So there's an element of giving people what they need, 
but that's a really I find that a really difficult balance because I wholeheartedly believe that the uh, for me the the good stuff that you get from martial arts isn't the easy stuff. Yeah, is that is that would that uh, does that correlate with what you think is the case? Yeah, I mean that's that's certainly true. Uh, you cannot possibly develop unless you push yourself hard enough. Uh, and I would say that 90% has to come from the student, 10% has to come from the instructor. You know, so we've, in our 10%, we've got to be able to guide people in a way to let them understand how many twos make for. If you don't put this amount of effort in, there's no point in carrying on. Yeah. And those that put in the effort, those that stick it, those that stay, they're the ones that progress. Mm. It's, it's a real skill in being able to refine your club mm. to people so that you, you know, the, the towel's not wagging the dog. You know, the students aren't your um, customers. They're not punters. They're not, you know, they are students of the martial arts. And if they want to progress, they've got to put in the right kind of effort and the right amount of effort. And you've got to make that very clear to them. And the good thing with that is that if you are skillful enough to be able to do that, you will develop a very good, solid, sound club around you. Whereas if you treat it as a business only, then you are going to be forever chasing around students and trying to get them to stay and all that kind of stuff. You know, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, no, that, I think that's a very valid point. So one of the things that you mentioned just now, which was your suffering, excuse me, <clears throat> um, you're suffering with some health issues and, um, uh, when I when I last saw you at the UK Martial Arts Show, you actually did a demonstration live on stage from your chair, which was fantastic <laughs> to watch. Um, but how how does that affect your training personally? Because I know you still train, even with all the things that you're up against. I know that you still not only train but teach. Yeah, uh, to cut a really really long story extremely short, you know, in 2007 I had both knees replaced at the same time, fell over. And didn't know it at the time, but I severed all the quadriceps muscles on both legs. Right. Uh, and they didn't discover that until 2012. I had some five-hour surgery on each leg to try and rebuild them. It failed. I got sepsis in my leg. And then I, I've since I've had two lots of sepsis. I've had infections of cellulitis. I've had several knee replacements. I've ended up, my right leg is now fused straight. Um, so I've just got an iron bar for it and my left leg has got a knee replacement and both legs don't have any quads so my balance is very precarious it's very difficult I should probably be in a wheelchair all the time but I, I just don't want to do that um, so I would say at the moment most of my training has to be done sitting down uh, but I'm okay with that my you know my philosophy is that you're not what you used to be. There is only the present moment. You've got to be able to make the most of it. I, I, I'm, I, as you probably know, I still teach. Yes. Um, I'm running three, four um, Tai Chi coaching programs at the moment for instructors, uh, one of them being over in the Czech Republic. Um, so I still travel, I still do seminars, I still teach, but I do it all from a chair. Yeah, that was going to be something that I was going to uh, ask about because I know that you're um, doing the Tai Chi and the instructor stuff and all that. And obviously, you have your own system as well, which you started in 1988, I believe. Um, that she That's right, Arts. Yeah, mm. that's right. And so, yeah. with, 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 uh, has your teaching style obviously has had to adapt to the current situation? But have you found that an easy transition? Because there was um, the wonderful Billy Robinson who was teaching cash wrestling up until uh, he unfortunately passed away a number of years ago. Um, he had some mobility issues, but he was teaching right up until the last minute. And it, it was interesting to see how he managed to get the information across. So how have you found some sort of tricks around that? Yeah, I, I'm very lucky in the, what we were talk, talking about earlier about developing a good team around you. I've got a very good, strong team around me. And so therefore, I've got easily enough people to help and demonstrate and if you look on any of my coaching programs, I've always got three or four helpers that are there to demonstrate movements and help guide people through movements and so on. So, you know, number one is if you've done it right and you've taught people properly, you've got a good team around you. And um, I'd say all of the people that are on the coaching programs, 
The majority of them are high grade martial arts instructors. Probably average grade is about six then. And um, so they're all good people and they're all un understanding people. So yeah, I mean, that way it works. Even when I go to do seminars, they put a chair out for me or I take a chair with me. I take someone with me to help demonstrate or I use the instructor there. Uh, you also learn that if you can't demonstrate it too much physically, you've got to use it there. You know, yeah. you've got to have a brain in gear that you can explain things the right way. Funnily enough, Toro Takemizawa always used to say to me, you should be able to teach without moving. He said, you should be able to teach as if you're on the radio, which actually, that was probably 1982 or three, he said that to me. Uh, and now that everyone's trying to teach over Zoom and the internet, a lot of them are trying to do the same thing now. Mm, yeah, so, well, that's, uh, oddly enough, I was going to say, that's, that's one of the sort of questions that I was going to ask about, well, obviously the current situation and, and social media as a whole. Um, again, coming from a time before the internet even existed, everyone under 35 is like, <gasps> at this point, um, but coming from an age before all this information was available, do you think that social media has actually been a help or a hindrance to martial arts? Yeah, I said to my granddaughter the other day that I took my driving test on a horse and cart. <laughs> and she believed me. Um, that's how old I am, I suppose. Uh, I think that social media has been brilliant. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's really helped a lot. It's like anything, really. There's a good and bad side to it. And I think that uh, if you can use um, social media right, um, I was very lucky that before the kind of the virus thing happened, um, I'd already developed an online platform. Mm. So uh, yeah. I already had all the facilities there. You know, so for a, a lot of other people are trying to do um, catch up at the moment. But um, I think that as a, a teaching and learning platform, it's very good. I think as a communication platform, it's absolutely brilliant. You said you used to read my stuff in combat, traditional karate, uh, and so on. Um, but that didn't reach that many people. Mm. Uh, and you didn't get much feedback. So you'd write things and put them out there, but you, you, you wouldn't know if anybody had read them. You didn't get any feedback. You didn't know how to change what you was writing. With, with um, social media, you can put it out there in, in blogs. You can put it out on videos. You can put it out on, you know, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, etc. Um, there's so many uh, media, that, and you can get a, an immediate feedback. If you um, delete and block all the trolls and the idiots, so that your feed is basically a good, nourishing feed, and you're getting some good, honest feedback from people all over the world, you, 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 you couldn't ask for more than that. It's brilliant. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I I was explaining this to a friend of mine a while ago who's non-martial arts, who doesn't. <clears throat> do any martial arts and I said we live in a world now where it is entirely feasible so if we look at it from your point of view he's a big football fan and I said if you suddenly just you know PM'd David Beckham and said would you mind awfully if we have a cup of tea and a chat and maybe even a kick around in the back garden that he would say yeah all right pop around in 10 minutes the martial arts world is actually like that I can you know I can reach out to people all across the world people who I who I you know followed for years and have a huge respect for and that that's given us that opportunity which is absolutely incredible and that's one of the things i think people sometimes forget because when we're inside the bubble it's easy for us to have a moan sometimes but we forget just how how lucky we are within the martial arts community that the vast majority of people will share with you they will you know they will give information freely and they will they will engage yeah i think an awful lot of people moan about um, social media and so you know there's so many idiots there's so many this and that um, there's so many dojos whatever but at, at the end of the day there's a lot of very good people out there mm. and I've proven that with my coaching program you know people have come onto that from uh, Wing Chun, Krav Maga, all the different styles of karate, Kung Fu, Taekwondo, all high-grade instructors they all get together in the hall never had a problem i've been running it for three years um so the first group of, are now in their second year of the advanced program the the second lot are in the first year of their advanced program and i've got um another lot onto the beginners 
and in the Czech Republic they're just going from the beginners to the advanced never had a problem with people from all different martial arts so it's one of those things you know that that old story of um, the the traveler goes up to the world to get a drink and the old boy's sitting there and he asks the old boy what they're like in the town ahead and the old boy says you know what was they like in the town you come from and he said they're horrible nasty people and he says that's the same way you're going and then the next guy comes along same question what were they like in the town you come from brilliant people lovely and he says that's what they're like in the town you're going so you know it, it's it's all about you one of the reasons that i study philosophy and zen and buddhism and so on so much is because you know we've got to develop ourselves from the inside out not from the outside in yes yes and that's a never-ending uh, never in journey and, and, and in all fairness is one of the things I like best about um, the stuff that you put out is exactly that it does it, it, it quite often it's not only enlightening but it does ask you to sort of question yourself a little bit and I find that I find that really really interesting so how can people contact you or find you if they're interested in the things that you're doing and want to be involved I'm everywhere. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> if you put a search anywhere, you will find me. Yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm on TikTok, but I don't do TikTok videos. I know that's your uh, medium as well. A and um, uh, I've got a blog, uh, which is steverow.com, uh, steve-row.com. Um, our online platform is shikonthinkific.com. Um, so you can get onto the online platform. There's a lot of free. I put everything on my online platform is free at the moment. All the time that we've got this virus thing, um, so I put all of my students from the dojo on it, and I've offered it out there because the um, particularly the talks I've been doing um, of how to deal with fear, and um, yeah, I think that's really important for people. So it's, it's, it's easy to find me. It's easy to get in touch with me. If anyone messages me, I'll normally answer within an hour or so anyway. So, uh, yeah, I'm actually quite easy to, to get a hold of. I'm kind of recruiting for next year's um, coaching program at the moment. I've, it's more than half filled at the moment already for 2021. But you know, if anyone is interested in that, I've got a, a page on it on my blog. and. Um, they, they can get in touch with me. I think so for anyone that... Is, sorry, so just, just, is there an entry level on that? No, it, it's open for, for anyone. And um, I think that particularly anyone that wants to um, add to their martial arts spectrum to add the internal side of it. As you know, my Tai Chi is a martial art as well. So it, it's very much... Um, it's structured so that they go through the Nei Gong first they have to learn the internal aspects. They have to learn the meditation. They have to learn how to um, develop their emotional intelligence um, through the training, through Neigong. And then the Qigong is the energy flows through the body, the exercises to develop the genes for energy and power through the body. And then we get into the forms, um, the, the normal tai, tai Chi forms, and push. we do a lot of push hands work. And uh, that then, when it goes into the advanced, we sprinkle the martial fairy dust over it. And that's where you get into broadsword, double-edged sword, spear, two-person sets, and all that kind of stuff. And the um, applications of all the moves. Okay. I love it because it, it, it's there for, um, for me, it's the bit I've enjoyed most. In 2015, I very nearly died. I, I really was at death's door for about three months. I, everyone thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. I, I wrote my book of poetry from my deathbed, and I thought that was going to be the last thing that I ever did. Uh, published it, and then I lived. <laughs> it was like, oh shit, what do I do now? Yeah, um, yeah you're, you're going to need another swan song, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, I, uh, I mean, that leads me to my final question, really, because that all sounds fantastic, and I'm sure that the, the people are going to be interested in that. But, um, so my last question for you really today is uh, if you could if you could pick one thing that you've learned through your martial arts that has been sort of the most valuable for the rest of your life can you could you sort of quantify what that is it's a, a soft front and a strong back you know okay. so the front should be polite cur courteous compassionate careful mindful and the back should have resolve determination and power Fantastic answer, yeah, that's great. So, 
uh, Steve, thank you so much for coming on and having a chat with us. It's been a genuine pleasure. And um, hopefully this won't be the last time that, uh, that we get to do this. Yeah, no, I'm working very much to get fit and healthy because we've still got a lot to, to, to do, so I can't die again just yet. No, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming on, my friend. You're welcome, Matt. Thanks very much. Cheers.